section four of the three impostors by arthur Mackin. this librivox recording is in the public domain part one of novel of the dark valley i am the son of a poor but learned clergyman in the west of england but i am forgetting these details are not of special interest i will briefly state then my father who was as i have said a learned man who never learnt the specious arts by which the great are flattered would never condescend to the despicable pursuit of self-advertisement though his fondness for ancient ceremonies and quaint customs combined with a kindness of heart that was unequalled and a primitive and fervent piety endeared him to his moorland parishioners such were not the steps by which clergy then rose in the church and at sixty my father was still incumbent of the little benefice he had accepted in his thirtieth year the income of the living was barely sufficient to support life in the decencies which are expected of the anglican parson and when my father died a few years ago i his only child found myself thrown upon the world with a slender capital of less than a hundred pounds and all the problem of existence before me i felt that there was nothing for me to do in the country and as usually happens in such cases london drew me like a magnet one day in august in the early morning while the dew still glittered on the turf and on the high green banks of the lane a neighbour drove me to the railway station and i bade good-bye to the land of the broad moors and unearthly battlements of the wild tors it was six o'clock as we neared london the faint sickly fume of the brickfields about acton came in puffs through the open window and a mist was rising from the ground presently the brief view of successive streets prim and uniform struck me with a sense of monotony the hot air seemed to grow hotter and when we had rolled beneath the dismal and squalid houses whose dirty and neglected backyards border the line near paddington i felt as if i should be stifled in this fainting breath of london i got a hansom and drove off and every street increased my gloom grey houses with blinds drawn down whole thoroughfares almost desolate and the foot passengers who seemed to stagger wearily along rather than walk all made me feel a sinking at heart i put up for the night at a hotel in a street leading from the strand where my father had stayed on his few brief visits to town and when i went out after dinner the real gaiety and bustle of the strand and fleet street could cheer me but little for in all this great city there was no single human whom i could claim even as an acquaintance i will not weary you with the history of the next year for the adventures of a man who sinks are too trite to be worth recalling my money did not last me long i found that i must be neatly dressed or no one to whom i applied would so much as listen to me and i must live in a street of decent reputation if i wish to be treated with common civility i applied for various posts for which as i now see i was completely devoid of qualification i tried to become a clerk without having the smallest notion of business habits and i found to my cost that a general knowledge of literature and an execrable style of penmanship are far from being looked upon with favour in commercial circles i had read one of the most charming of the works of a famous novelist of present day and i frequented the fleet street taverns in hope of making literary friends and so getting introductions which i understood were indispensable in the career of letters i was disappointed i once or twice ventured to address gentlemen who were sitting in adjoining boxes and i was answered politely indeed but 
in a manner that told me my advances were unusual pound by pound my small resources melted i could no longer think of appearances i migrated to a shy quarter and my meals became mere observances i went out at one and returned to my room at two but nothing but a mere milk cake had occurred in the interval in short i became acquainted with misfortune and as i sat amidst slush and ice on a seat in hyde park munching a piece of bread i realized the bitterness of poverty and the feelings of a gentleman reduced to something far below the condition of a vagrant in spite of all discouragement i did not desist in my efforts to earn a living i consulted advertisement columns i kept my eyes open for a chance i looked in at the windows of stationers shops but all in vain one evening i was sitting in a free library and i saw an advertisement in one of the papers it was something like this uh, wanted by a gentleman a person of literary taste and abilities as secretary and amanuensis must not object to travel of course i knew that such an advertisement would have answers by the hundreds and i thought my own chance of securing the post extremely small however i applied at the address given and wrote to mr smith who was staying at a large hotel at the west end i must confess that my heart gave a jump when i received a note a couple of days later asking me to call at the cosmopole at my earliest convenience i do not know sir what your experiences of life may have been and so i cannot tell whether you have known such moments a slight sickness my heart beating rather more rapidly than usual a choking in the throat and a difficulty of utterance such were my sensations as i walked to the cosmopole i had to mention the name twice before the hall porter could understand me and as i went upstairs my hands were wet i was a good deal struck by mr smith's appearance he looked younger than i did and there was something mild and hesitating about his expression he was reading when i came in and he looked up when i gave my name my dear sir he said i am really delighted to see you i have read very carefully the letter you were good enough to send me am i to understand that this document is in your own handwriting he showed me the letter that i had written and i told him i was not so fortunate as to be able to keep a secretary myself then sir he went on the post i advertised is at your service you have no objection to travel i presume as you may imagine i closed pretty eagerly with the offer he made and thus i entered the service of mr smith the first few weeks i had no special duties i received a quarter's salary and a handsome allowance was made me in lieu of board and lodging one morning however when i called at the hotel according to instructions my master informed me that i must hold myself in readiness for a sea voyage and to spare necessary detail in the course of a fortnight we landed at new york mr smith told me that he engaged on a work of special nature in the compilation of which some peculiar researches had to be made in short i was given to understand that we were to travel to the far west after about a week had been spent in new york we took our seats in the cars and began a journey tedious beyond all conception day after day and night after night the great train rolled on threading its way through cities the very names of which were strange to me passing at slow speeds over perilous viaducts skirting mountain ranges and pine forests and plunging into dense tracts of wood where mile after mile and hour after hour the same monotonous growth of brushwood met the eye and all along the continual clatter and rattle of the wheels upon the ill-laid lines 
made it difficult to hear the voices of our fellow passengers we were a heterogeneous and ever-changing company often i woke up in the dead of night with a sudden grinding jar of the brakes and looking out found that we had stopped in the shabby street of some frame-built town lighted chiefly by the flaring windows of the saloon a few rough-looking fellows would often come out to stare at the cars and sometimes passengers got down and sometimes there was a party of two or three waiting on the wooden sidewalk to get on board many of the passengers were english humble households torn up from the moorings of a thousand years and bound for some problematical paradise in the alkali desert of the rockies i heard the men talking to one another of the great profits to be made on the virgin soil of america and two or three who were mechanics expatiated on the wonderful wages given to skilled labor on the railways and in the factories of the states this talk usually fell dead after a few minutes and i could see a sickness and dismay in the faces of these men as they looked at the ugly brush and at the desolate expanse of the prairie dotted here and there with frame houses devoid of garden or flowers or trees standing all alone in what might have been a great gray sea frozen into stillness day after day the waving skyline and the desolation of a land without form or color or variety appalled the hearts of such of us as were englishmen and once in the night as i lay awake i heard a woman weeping and sobbing and asking what she had done to come to such a place her husband tried to comfort her in the broad speech of gloucester telling her that the ground was so rich that one had only to plough it up and it would grow sunflowers of itself but she cried for her mother and her old cottage and the beehives like a little child the sadness of it all overwhelmed me and i had no heart to think of other matters the question of what mr smith could have to do in such a country and of what manner of literary research he carried on in the wilderness hardly troubled me now and again my situation struck me as peculiar i had been engaged as a literary assistant at a handsome salary and yet my master was still almost a stranger to me sometimes he would come to where i was sitting in the cars and make a few banal remarks about the country but for the most part of the journey he kept to himself not speaking to any one and so far as i could judge deep in his thoughts it was i think the fifth day from new york when i received the intimation that we should shortly leave the cars i had been watching some distant mountains which rose wild and savage before us and i was wondering if there were human beings so unhappy as to speak of home in connection with those piles of lumbered rock when mr smith touched me lightly on the shoulder you will be glad to be done with the cars i have no doubt mr wilkins he said you were looking at the mountains i think well i hope we shall be there to-night the train stops at reading and i dare say we shall manage to find our way a few hours later the brakesman brought the train to a standstill at the reading depot and we got out i noticed that the town though of course built almost entirely of frame houses was larger and busier than any we had passed for the last two days the depot was crowded and as the bell and whistle sounded i saw that a number of persons were preparing to leave the cars while an even greater number were waiting to get on board besides the passengers there was a pretty dense crowd of people some of whom had come to meet or to see off their friends and relatives while others were mere loafers several of our english fellow-passengers got down at reading but the confusion was so great that they were lost to my sight almost immediately 
mr smith beckoned to me to follow him and we were soon in the thick of the mass and the continual ringing of bells the hubbub of voices the shrieking of whistles and the hiss of escaping steam confused my senses and i wondered dimly as i struggled after my employer where we were going and how we should be able to find our way through an unknown country mr smith had put on a wide-brimmed hat which he had sloped over his eyes and as all men wore hats of the same pattern it was with some difficulty that i distinguished him in the crowd we got free at last and he struck down a side street and made one or two sharp turns to right and left it was getting dusk and we seemed to be passing through a shy portion of the town there were few people about in the ill-lighted streets and these few were men of the most unprepossessing pattern suddenly we stopped before a corner house a man was standing at the door apparently on the lookout for someone and i noticed that he and smith gave glances at one another from new york city i expect mister from new york all right they're ready and you can have em when you choose i know my orders you see and i mean to run this business through very well mr evans that is what we want our money is good you know bring them round i had stood silent listening to this dialogue and wondering what it meant smith began to walk impatiently up and down the street and the man was still standing at his door he had given a whistle and i saw him looking me over in a leisurely way as if to make sure of my face for another time i was thinking what all this could mean when an ugly slouching lad came up a side passage leading two raw-boned horses get up mr wilkins and be quick about it said smith we ought to be on our way we rode off together into the gathering darkness and before long i looked back and saw the far plain behind us with the lights of the town glimmering faintly and in front rose the mountains smith guided his horse on the rough track as surely as if he had been riding along piccadilly and i followed him as well as i could i was weary and exhausted and scarcely took note of anything i felt that the track was a gradual ascent and here and there i saw great boulders by the road the ride made but little impression on me i have a faint recollection of passing through a dense black pine forest where our horses had to pick their way among the rocks and i remember the peculiar effect of the rarefied air as we kept still mounting higher and higher i think i must have been half asleep for the latter half of the ride and it was with a shock that i heard smith saying here we are wilkins this is blue rock park you will enjoy the view to-morrow to-night we will have something to eat and then go to bed a man came out of a rough-looking house and took the horses and we found some fried steak and coarse whiskey awaiting us inside i had come to a strange place there were three rooms the room in which we had supper smith's room and my own the deaf old man who did the work slept in a sort of shed and when i woke up the next morning and walked out i found that the house stood in a sort of hollow amongst the mountains the clumps of pines and some enormous bluish-gray rocks that stood here and there between the trees had given the place the name of blue rock park on every side the snow-covered mountains surrounded us the breath of the air was as wine and when i climbed the slope and looked down i could see that so far as any human fellowship was concerned i might as well have been wrecked on some small island in mid-pacific the only trace of man i could see was the rough log-house where i had slept and in my ignorance i did not know that there were similar houses within comparatively easy distance as distance is reckoned in the rockies but at the moment the utter dreadful loneliness rushed upon me and the thought of the great plain and the great sea that parted me from the world i knew caught me by the throat and i wondered if i should die there in mountain hollow it was a terrible instant and i have not yet forgotten it 
of course i managed to conquer my horror i said i should be all the stronger for experience and i made up my mind to make the best of everything it was a rough life enough and rough enough board and lodging i was left entirely to myself smith i scarcely ever saw nor did i know when he was in the house i have often thought that he was far away have been surprised to see him walking out of his room locking the door behind him and putting the key in his pocket and on several occasions when i fancied he was busy in his room i have seen him come in with his boots covered with dust and dirt so far as work went i enjoyed a complete sinecure i had nothing to do but walk about the valley to eat and to sleep with one thing and another i grew accustomed to the life managed to make myself pretty comfortable and by degrees i began to venture farther away from the hollow and to explore the country one day i had contrived to get into a neighboring valley and suddenly i came upon a group of men sawing timber i went up to them hoping that perhaps some of them might be englishmen at all events they were human beings and i should hear articulate speech for the old man i have mentioned besides being half blind and stone deaf was wholly dumb so far as i was concerned i was prepared to be welcomed in a rough and ready fashion without much of the forms of politeness but the grim glances and the short gruff answers i received astonished me i saw the men glancing oddly at each other and one of them who stopped work began fingering a gun and i was obliged to return on my path uttering curses on the fate which had brought me into a land where men were more brutish than the very brutes the solitude of the life began to oppress me as with a nightmare and a few days later i determined to walk to a kind of station some miles distant where a rough inn was kept for the accommodation of hunters and tourists english gentlemen occasionally stopped there for the night and i thought i might perhaps fall in with some one of better manners than the inhabitants of the country i found as i had expected a group of men lounging about the door of the log house that served as a hotel and as i came nearer i could see that heads were put together and looks interchanged and when i walked up the six or seven trappers stared at me in stony ferocity and with something of the disgust that one eyes a loathsome and venomous snake i felt that i could bear it no longer and i called out is there such a thing as an englishman here or any one with a little civilization one of the men put his hand to his belt but his neighbor checked him and answered me you'll find we've got some of the resources of civilization before very long mister and i expect you'll not fancy them extremely but anyway there's an englishman tarrying here and i've no doubt he'll be glad to see you there you are that's mr dobernoon a young man dressed like an english country squire came and stood at the door and looked at me one of the men pointed to me and said that's the individual we were talking about last night thought you might like to have a look at him squire and here he is the young fellow's good-natured english face clouded over and he glanced sternly at me and turned away with a gesture of contempt and aversion sir i cried i do not know what i have done to be treated in this manner you are my fellow countryman and i expected some courtesy he gave me a black look and made as if he would go in but he changed his mind and faced me you are rather imprudent i think to behave in this manner you must be counting on a forbearance which cannot last very long which may last a very short time indeed and let me tell you this sir you may call yourself an englishman and drag the name of england through the dirt but you need not count on any english influence to help you if i were you i would not stay here much longer he went into the inn and the men watched my face as i stood there wondering whether i was going mad the woman of the house came out and stared at me as if i were a wild beast or a savage and i turned to her and spoke quietly i am very hungry and thirsty i have walked a long way i have plenty of money will you give me something to eat and drink no i won't 
out she said you had better quit this end of section four part one of novel of the dark valley